Thank you. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, so um, wonderful to be here, Bongiorno. Thanks so much for coming. And it's really, really great to be in person again after a couple of years. So what I'm going to be talking about today is really AI and machine learning for today and tomorrow. I'm going to talk a little bit about the opportunities that we see that are available in AI and machine learning. And then I'm going to talk about some of the things that we have for Android developers today. And then I'm going to give a little bit of a sneak preview of some of the stuff that we're working on for Android developers in the AI and machine learning space that we hope to bring out either later this year or sometime next year. So I always like to start with the opportunity and talking about that. And I drew this diagram a couple of years ago. And this diagram was of the GDP growth in Western European and North American countries. And you know, it started around the 1950s, this diagram. And you can see it's just generally up, except that cliff on the right, which you could probably guess was the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And you can't really learn a lot from this. You just see that it's generally increasing. So I did, I did a derivative of this one where I wanted to see, like, well, what was the function of the economy compared to previous years? And when I did this derivative, I ended up finding there's a couple of these really interesting plateaus. And this first plateau started in about 1993 and it ended in about 2007. Can anybody guess what was the trigger for it? All right, it was really, it was the advent of the web. And if you think about it, before this time, companies like Google didn't exist, Amazon didn't exist, Apple were like an obscure hardware company, uh, Microsoft were there, but they made desktop software, there was, there was no such thing as the cloud or anything like that. But the advent of that web, that one technology trigger, and the ability for developers to build on a platform and build things that had never been seen before, like online commerce and search engines and that kind of thing, became this huge trigger to the economy and led to that economic growth over that period of time. The second plateau began around 2007 and it ended at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Can anybody guess what that one was? Yeah, it was the Android and uh, iOS. It was like the smartphone platform, right? So again, a whole new era of businesses came out of this. Things like Uber, you know, think about, you know, anything that's a mobile first platform. And as a result, like, we, again, it triggered economic activity. Now, we have this cliff on the right, which was the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Uh, but one, like, statistic that I saw from our friends in Apple was like in 2021, despite the mass loss of jobs and the drop in the economy, that they were actually able to publish statistics that in the United Kingdom, 600,000 jobs were added in the app ecosystem alone. So while millions are being lost elsewhere, you know, they were able to add 600,000 jobs in the app ecosystem. And that's the numbers that Apple have reported. The Android ecosystem has also added some. Nobody's done research to see what that is, but we can see that it would be obviously in the millions have been added despite the economic drop. So new technology revolutions, new platforms that developers can build on trigger this massive economic activity. And these two plateaus have been the two biggest ones in my career. And if you think about how the world has changed since they came online, right? So first was the advent of the web, then was the advent of the mobile platform. And we always like to joke in Google, like at the beginning of this, you know, it was common wisdom that you don't talk to strangers on the internet and you don't get into strangers' cars. Now at the end of this, we literally summon strangers from the internet to get into their car when we want to go somewhere. But that was the advent of the web and the advent of mobile. But here today, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. So what I, to this, I see this being the next great wave, the next great platform for developers, which will trigger economic activity. So it's not just us talking about it. For example, the World Economic Forum did a Jobs of Tomorrow report. And as we heard earlier on, a lot of people are hiring here. Uh, so, and like, if you look at the growth in jobs and growth in economic activity, we see data and AI 37%, engineering and cloud computing plus 34%, and then all of the stuff that's used to support that, people and culture, product development, sales and marketing, all growing as a result. So it's not just for developers. Developers are the folks in these last two revolutions are the ones that trigger the economic activity, and that pulls everybody up. So we see with data and AI, the growth of that is going to be massive. But it's not just the World Economic Forum. In Forbes, they did a report where they were looking at the size of the machine learning market, and they measured it in 2017 as being about 1.5 US, uh, 1.5 billion US dollars. 
and it would grow to about 21 billion by 2024. And 2024 is like less than a year and a half away now. AI software revenue growing from about $10 billion to $126 billion by 2025. So the CAGR, which is compound annual growth rate of these, is in the 40s, which are obscene numbers. You know, if your portfolio was growing that much, you could retire tomorrow, that kind of thing. So uh, we, we definitely see the opportunity that's there um, for everybody. And Android is one of the keys to that, um, because if you think about it, AI is nothing without somewhere to run it. You need to be able to deploy it, and Android literally puts it into the palm of your user's hands. So what is AI? What's all the fuss? Why do we, you know, how is this going to happen? So I always like to talk about, because this is a developer conference, you know, if we think about artificial intelligence, let's take a step back and let's forget all the hype and let's forget all the flashy demos and robots and movies and all of that kind of thing, and let's talk about what it actually is. So I always like to talk about coding. So explicit coding, which we've all done, which we, most of us are making our bread and butter on, is when you define rules that determine the behavior of a program. So for example, if you're writing a game, like this breakout style game, you're the one that, as a developer who thinks about, I have to express in code what happens to make the ball move, what happens when the ball hits a brick, what happens when it hits the bat, what happens when the bat misses the ball three times and it's game over. And as a programmer, it's our job to think up all of those rules, to create those rules in a programming language like Kotlin or Java or something like that, to test them and to make sure that it works for every case. This is what we've been doing all of our lives as developers. You know, one of the things that this does is gives us the ability to make amazing apps. But there are limitations in these apps because and there are many, many scenarios out there where it's just too complex for us to think up the rules that actually create that. And I'll get back to that in a second. And that leads to this diagram that I like to show for the traditional programming paradigm. And the traditional programming paradigm is we have rules, we express those rules in a programming language, they act on data, like in the case of the game that I just showed, the data might be the position of the ball, position of the bricks, how the user has moved the bat, those kind of things. And they generate answers. Is it game over? Should I remove the brick? Those types of things. All the AI and machine learning revolution is, is a remix of this diagram, where instead of us um, expressing the rules ourselves, we'll have a computer figure them out. Now, let me give an example of that. Uh, say you're wearing an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or something like that, and you want to write an application for that for activity detection. So, for example, activity detection for fitness, like walking, how would you do that with rules? So, for example, I might say, okay, I can, there's an accelerometer on the device, and I might be able to you know, gauge from the accelerometer how fast the person is walking or how fast they're moving. And if it's below a certain speed, we'll say, they're walking. Okay, it's crude, but it works. So then I say, well, what if they're running? Then I'll go, well, if they're below that speed, they're walking. Otherwise, they're running. Uh, again, a rule that I've expressed in a programming language. And then what about if they're biking? I'll say, well, if their speed's below a certain amount, they're walking. If it's higher than a certain amount, they're biking. If it's in between the two, they're running. It sort of works, right? You know, the developers in the room are already finding the corner cases, you know, that you might uh, bike uphill slower than you run downhill and things like that. And here's where it becomes difficult to start expressing these things in rules. But then what happens if you want to determine golf and playing golf? It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> how, do I, how do I even write rules for that? And as a result, Devices that have been able to do these things are only becoming commonplace now because it's a lot easier for you to determine this kind of thing with machine learning than it would be for you to write the rules. It might take thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of code to determine if someone's playing golf. And is it worth all that investment just to determine if someone's playing golf? Probably not. So the diagram I showed earlier on, the rules we express ourselves, they act on data, and they give us answers like the person's walking, biking, or running. But if I remix that diagram to say, well, what if I give a computer the answers, and what if I give the computer the data, and then I say, have the computer figure out the rules? So what if I get lots of people to wear a device and go running, and lots of people to wear one and go biking and swimming and golfing and all of those kind of things, and gather the data from that, and then determine the patterns from that data that are matched to the activity, Computers are really, really good at that. And then, you know, I'll have a new type of application where I haven't written the rules. I've just matched data in a number of cases. So it might look a little bit like this, where now, instead of me kind of trying to figure out the rules for what's walking, biking, and running, I have all of that data. I've labeled that data. 
And then a computer is able to go through that data and maybe spot something like this that's always there when a person's walking. And, you know, this is just a simulation. It's not this easy, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, and like, you know, the, hey, there's a number of bits here that are always set when they're running, biking, golfing, that kind of thing. And, you know, so as a result, then this process is where a machine learns how to match the data to the labels for that data. And once it's learned how to do that, we now have a model that if I pass future data into it, the machine is able to then parse that data and to be able to determine something about that data that says, hey, there's a high likelihood this person's walking, biking, or running. Now, that's a very simple example. I want to show a slightly more complicated one now that I'm going to add to my slides. Oops. The hardest part is turning it on. So now I have auto captions. So as I speak, the same thing is happening here that my machine is listening to the sound coming in of me speaking. It's doing a pattern match of that against what it's been labeled for. And, and that might be sub-elements of a word or full words or those kind of things. And then even though I have a strong Irish accent and a lot of humans can't understand me, uh, the, uh, the machine is generally able to understand me and is able to generate captions like this. It's also pretty good at doing it. And I, oh, one question I always like to ask is, who knows the second longest word in the English language? I actually asked this once to a group in London, and one person knew it. They put their hand up, and the word is actually, are you ready? Anti-disestablishmentarianism. And it gets it right. And often, if I have a fast internet connection, it will actually finish the word before I do, because there's some heuristics and statistical analysis going on here. And at some point in the middle of the word, there's only one word that will actually complete the sentence. And does it getting it wrong? Uh-oh. And uh, it doesn't always get it right. And then it will actually finish the word before I do. So I'll say it again. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. Ah, oh, it was slower this time. Never mind. Uh, but, you know, so this is the idea that you can start opening up entirely new classes of application that weren't previously possible. And here's where I think AI and machine learning is exciting, particularly for mobile developers. You know, thinking about earlier on when I first mentioned the platform of the web, that opened up classes of application nobody thought of. You know, a search engine, <laughs> right? You know, things like that. Who needed a search engine before the web? Uh, the, the advent of the mobile platform and Instagram and Uber and all of these kind of things that were mobile first. Who needed them before the advent of the platform? These were new classes of application and new applications that grew out as a result of that. And that's what excites me most about AI and machine learning is that there's classes of applications that nobody's thought of yet, and there's a new way to be able to build things that might have previously been too difficult to build. So again, the paradigm, if you take nothing else away from this, the paradigm is the machine learning one is instead of you thinking in terms of code, where you write the code to determine the rules, is that you gather the data, you label that data, and then the code that you write is code that's used to match the labels to the data and learn, and hence the term machine learning, learn how that data generates those labels and vice versa. When you've done that, you create something called a model. That model will live on a device, in the cloud, or wherever it is that you want it to run. Uh, when it runs on device, one of the unique things about it with Android ones is, of course, the entire model is on the device, so the user data never has to leave the device to go somewhere else to be parsed. It can actually entirely happen on the device, so you can maintain privacy and stuff like that. But your deliverable is this thing called a model. So uh, the framework that we have for building models like that is called TensorFlow. Uh, we're doing a whole bunch of new stuff that's coming out next year in TensorFlow, but I'm going to be talking about TensorFlow 2.x today and some of the things that are available in it. And one great example that I always like to talk about is something called Project Guideline. Now, Project Guideline is an Android app. And this Android app was built for a runner who is blind. And if you've ever seen blind runners, typically what they have to do is they put their hand on the shoulder of a guide runner, or they're tethered to a guide runner. And the guide runner can be very, very good and understand the speed at which the blind person runs. But the blind person is, or the visually impaired person is still limited based on the guide runner. Maybe that runner is going too fast for them in the moment. Maybe they're going too slow for them. And it's taking away some of their freedom to be able to run. So we wanted to see if this was something that we could solve on an Android device using AI and machine learning. So what we did was we built an Android application. And uh, for the course that this person was going to run in New York City, we painted a yellow line along the road. 
And then the idea was, well, an Android application, you can see it's strapped around their waist here. Android phones, like most phones, have a camera on them. What if we could see what the camera is looking at in front of the runner? And if it sees the yellow line, it will tell them to keep running along the line. But if they steer away from the line, like if they drift off to the left or the right, and sometimes the line's going around corners and stuff like that, it will give them a notification that they need to move, that they need to change. Or if there's a runner too close in front of them, it will give them a notification to slow down so that you don't you know, take that runner down with you, and those kind of things. So a very, very complicated application, a thing that would be computationally infeasible if we were thinking about how do I write the rules for this. But with machine learning, it was actually very, very simple. So let me give an example of how this actually worked. Again, this is just a crude one where I kind of drew these diagrams to say how this would work. So uh, in this case, prior to the race, we had people run around the course and film uh, what they saw, or what the camera around their waist saw. We had some people run along the line. We had some people run to the left of the line. We had some people run to the right of the line. We gathered the data for all of those frames, and we said, well, guess what? When the camera looks like this, or the view from the camera looks like this, you're good, keep going. If it looks like this, you probably need to shift to the right. If it looks like this, you probably need to shift to the left. And now we have that data, and we have those labels, and the scenario that I spoke about earlier on, you know, for machine learning is, it becomes very, very simple. Now, at the moment, this is Python coding. One of the things I want to talk about is the future for Android developers, because we know a lot of Android developers, you love to work in Kotlin. You don't want to learn a new language like Python. You don't want to learn all the new code and all of the new things for machine learning to be able to build models like this. We're working that, and I'll show that in a moment. Um, but for something like this one, the people had to spin up Python, spin up TensorFlow, and a framework called Keras to be able to create the model that would then live on an Android device, and at the time that the person would be running, then it would look at the feed from the camera, determine from the feed of the camera if the person is running correctly or if they need to adjust themselves, and then give an audio cue to the runner what they need to do. So uh, that's one simple example. Another example that I like to show, and this to me is where kind of we can show the possibilities of new types of discovery or new types of application where AI can do things that not just were computationally infeasible, but things that we previously thought might be impossible. So diabetic retinopathy is the world's fastest uh, cause of blindness. And um, one of the things about it is that it's very easily avoided with early diagnosis. So regular screening is the key to avoiding blindness. And uh, countries like India, um, there are a shortage of qualified ophthalmologists. So we found in our research that there was a shortage of over 120,000 eye doctors in India, and as a result, 45% of patients with diabetic retinopathy suffer some kind of vision loss um, and, uh, before they get diagnosed. And that's a shame because it's easily avoided, but it's just the lack of doctors. So we hired a bunch of doctors, and we had these doctors um, go through tens of thousands of retina scans and label those retina scans with these five labels from no diabetic retinopathy all the way up to proliferative. And a human expert was able to look at the data and determine from the data with things like hemorrhages the level of disease that was in the eye. But again, think about what I showed earlier on. Now we have data, now we have labels. Can we have a computer look at that data, look at those labels, figure out how they match each other, and build a model off of that? This is the architecture of what it looks like. It was a neural network of a type called a convolutional neural network, 27 layers in it, quite complicated, state of the art at the time, it was about five years ago. Nowadays, it's the kind of thing you can run for free in a collab. Uh, five years ago, it was the kind of thing that could only be done in a research institute. That's how fast this stuff is moving. And the results ended up being that the model was 95% accurate at spotting disease in a retina scan, where the average ophthalmologist was only 91% accurate. Okay, so we could see that this thing has legs. It really, really did work. But then we advanced that a little bit, and we got it up to, I think it was about 98% accuracy, where it was on a par, not just with an average ophthalmologist, but with a specialist. So we could see that this thing is important. This thing could actually work. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the opportunity for developers in being able to do new things that weren't previously thought possible. So one of our research scientists came up with an idea when they were looking at the data that when the doctors did a scan of these retinas and they had the details of the patients, uh, one of the things of the details of the patient was they had the patient's gender. 
And we thought, okay, well, this is just a case of matching data to labels. What if we take a look at retinas and we match it to the person's gender rather than to where somebody kind of diagnosed the disease? So a human looking at a retina like this, even an ophthalmologist can look at this and have no idea of the person's gender. But a computer, it's just matching patterns. It would, should be a 50-50 chance. If there's nothing in there, you would guess like, you know, it's a coin flip to see if this retina belongs to a male or a female. What ended up happening is after running it through the algorithm, it got it right 97% of the time. So there was something in the data that a computer could see that a human cannot see. And now we can begin to say, hey, there's some really interesting applications of this. And you could actually, doing the same thing, we also knew the patient's age. So by looking at the retina, it was able to get the person's age to within a, like a mean average error of three and a quarter years. I bet most of you looking at me, if I did a survey and asked if you could guess my age, and you're looking at a whole lot more than the retina, and if I averaged that out, you'd be wrong by more than three and a quarter years. You know? And then the, the gender I mentioned was 97%. But even some things like HbA1c, which usually requires a blood draw you know, from a retina scan, have been able to get that to within 1.4% accuracy. So there's a lot of whole entirely new applications that are there for the taking. If you have the data and you can label that data, and you realize that computers are just very, very good at matching data to those labels, you can start doing things that were previously impossible. And this is where I'm so excited to go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, where the platform for new types of applications that nobody has thought of is there for the taking. So let's talk about Android. Uh, so now when it comes to Android, how do we get this onto Android? So I mentioned earlier on TensorFlow is the framework. Uh, when you've built a model in TensorFlow, it can be converted into something called a flat buffer. That flat buffer can then be loaded into TensorFlow Lite. The TensorFlow Lite runtime will execute on Android, will load that model, and you can wrap an application around it. And now, a little bit like the project guideline I mentioned, you can actually be able to build Android apps that do things artificially intelligently, if that's the correct words. And uh, so with TensorFlow Lite, part of the feedback that we had was that from Android developers was like, it's all very good, you show us flashy demos, it works great, but I'm an Android developer. I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a, um, a Python developer. I'm you know, not an artificial intelligence engineer. How can I get models onto my Android device quickly and easily? So one of the first things that we've put out there is something called TensorFlow Lite Model Maker. Anybody familiar with it? Has anybody used it out of interest? Okay, a few. Cool. Um, so Model Maker is a Python API. It's still not, uh, I'm going to talk about the future in a moment where we're doing stuff for, uh, for Android developers. But the idea behind Model Maker is typically the workflow of defining a model is like a bunch of steps like this. I have tiny little code on the right because it can be dozens or hundreds of lines to be able to create a model. In this case, this is a model for text analysis and text sentiment. So it's a lot of Python that somebody would have to write. But with Model Maker, we've tried to reduce that to the bare minimum, bare bones by building a number of common APIs, wrapping them, and making it as simple as possible for somebody able to build something. Still Python, though. So for example, here, um, if I was, uh, this is a model that I built for detecting um, spam in online comments, or detecting spam in, if you're doing comments in your Android application, where the idea was that if somebody was doing a spammy comment, typically what happens if you run a website or if you're an app where people make comments, you have to wait till they've made the comment. That comment gets stored on your back end. That comment gets reported by your users. You have to then go into the back end and remove it or moderate it or something like that. What we decided to do with this demo and this model, and it's out there for free, is if somebody was making a comment that was seen as spammy, it would actually warn them before they would send it, and it would forbid them from sending it until they'd edited it, that type of thing. So again, it's the type of thing you could do in an Android application to make your life a lot easier, make your user experience a lot easier. And this was you know, being able to train the model in about three or four lines of code. But here's the tricky part, and here's the difficult part for Android developers and for all mobile developers. You generally get the impression after seeing a demo or some of the stuff that I've spoken about that it looks a little bit like this. You have your Android app. Somebody's created a model for you. You have artificial intelligence that you can throw into your app. You put data in, you get data out, and everybody's happy. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. So for example, for something like Project Guideline that I spoke about earlier on, you think you can put a bitmap you know, that you've pulled from the camera into it. You get a string out of it that said, move left, move right, those kind of things. But it tends to be a lot more difficult than that. 
So what you have to do, first of all, is deploy a model to your device. That model will contain metadata about the model. Um, for an image-based model, like the, the project guideline one I mentioned, the metadata might be quite simple, just say the labels move left, move right, those kind of things. For a language-based model, like the comment spam, if you're familiar with building AI models for text, they have to have their own dictionary of words, they have to have vectors associated with those words, and a whole bunch of other stuff like that that generally would need to be deployed to your app as well. Um, the framework is called TensorFlow. The clue is in the name. Tensors flow in and tensors flow out. But as an Android developer, how many of you are familiar with the tensor data type? Exactly. Not many, right? Just a few. So the idea is, as an Android developer, you may be more used to bitmaps and strings and native data types. So as a result, there's a conversion of those into um, things such as tensors. And a, a, a pro tip is actually whenever I do job interviews, my tech question that I do in a job interview is I'll describe how a model reads a tensor as an array, and I'll describe a bitmap, and how do you convert a bitmap into an array of tensors? You know, and most Android developers actually fail that question. So uh, that makes me understand that this is something that's very hard. So what we're doing to make that easy is the, the frameworks that I mentioned, the model maker framework, and something called the task library, where now the idea is that as um, we ship an open source task library that will do things, for example, like taking a bitmap, converting it into input tensors that a model can recognize, and also parsing the output tensors from a model and turning that into high level data, uh, high level um, data types that, a, uh, you know, that you can understand, like a string or those types of stuff. Here's an example of what it looks like for an object detection algorithm. An object detection algorithm is similar to an image uh, classifier, where the image classifier is if I show you a picture of a cat, the computer says this is a picture of a cat. But if an object detection, when if I show you a picture of a cat, it will draw a bounding box on it, and it'll say the cat is here. So it's slightly different, a little bit more complex, because not only does it have to tell you what's in the image, it has to tell you where it is in the image. So think about the data coming out. You got the label saying it's a cat, and you got the data for the bounding box. So uh, this is what it would look like in Kotlin when using the, um, the APIs that we've created as a helper is, you know, you have, um, you just create an instance of an object detection, sorry, of an object detector, and um, you pass it a bitmap and, or an image, and it will give you back the bounding box details and that kind of thing. So again, we're striving to make it easier for you by building those API wrappers. Uh, you still have to create the code for the model yourself in Kotlin, um, but we're striving to make it easier for you by creating those, sorry, in Python, uh, but we're striving to make it easier for you by creating those wrappers so that as a Kotlin developer or a Swift developer, if you're, in, if you're also built for iOS, that you can at least use your high-level languages to be able to interact with these models. Okay, so peek at the future and what's next and what we're working on. So think about what I just showed and the complexity behind what I just showed. And if you want to build some kind of a machine learning model, that runs on a device, such as an Android device, you have the model itself and you got all of this code that wraps it. Now this code that wraps it, I'm gonna call it pipeline, because ultimately what happens is you're getting data in, you have to do something to that data, you pass that data to the, data to the model, the model gives you something back, you have to do something to that and then uh, present to the user. So the, all of that flow of data is the data pipeline. It might look something like this if you're doing something with a live camera, like we spoke about with the uh, project guideline. So you have a live camera feed. You've got to capture that live camera feed, maybe using something like Camera X. There's flow control. There's data pre-processing. Uh, the model is often built for a particular resolution of image. But as an Android developer, Android devices, there's so many different ones. There's so many different cameras. They feed you different resolutions. You've got to pre-process it into the resolution that the, monitor, that the model expects, that kind of thing. And then there's the post-processing that comes out of that. Again, converting those tensors back into strings that you can take action on them, that kind of stuff. Synchronization, UI, all that type of thing. It's pretty complex. In fact, it can look something like this, right, where you have all of these different things that you have to think about, buffer management, resource caching, thread management, all of that good stuff. So what we've been doing, and you may have heard of something called MediaPipe. Uh, MediaPipe, when we first launched it, the idea behind that was for streaming media solutions on mobile to be able to do things with AI and ML on that streaming media. So doing things like hand pose detection or body pose detection. Uh, the media pipe team who've done that have encapsulated all of their learnings of building applications around that into a set of APIs that we want to deliver to you. Uh, so um, we call this media pipe tasks. 
So the goal here is things like the flow control, the data pre-processing, have been all encapsulated as tasks so that you can have one line of code, sometimes zero lines of code if it's encapsulated in something else, that will allow you to do that task within your mobile application. So we're working hard on this at the moment. Um, we did a preview sneak peek release uh, just last week. Um, I'm going to show some of the new stuff from that release in a moment. Um, our first release of this, you know, for developers where you'll be able to open source, uh, download some of the code and play with some of these things is coming next month. So again, the, and so that's putting a model into an app and all of the surrounding code for that. But then the next thing and the most difficult thing that we hear from Android developers is building the model itself. I don't want to become a data scientist. I don't want to become an, a Python developer. I don't want to be, you know, get into the whole you know, dealing with the calculus and all of that kind of thing. So what we wanted to do to allow you to create custom models is first of all, um, there's two ways of doing that. Number one is taking existing models and tweaking them through a process that AI folks call transfer learning. Uh, but doing that under the hood in a way that you don't have to deal with all of the complexities of transfer learning. And then, of course, the other one is building models from scratch with your own data. So for the transfer learning folks, we've been building and deploying a bunch of common models with the wrappers that I mentioned around them that will allow you to do that. For common scenarios like um, text classification, understanding dialogue so you can build things like the caption that I have running here, a vision so that you can do things like understanding what's in an image like we did with the diabetic retinopathy. Uh, a growing and emerging one is audio, uh, being able to understand the world around you. Um, so you know your, your device has a microphone on it. And think about the applications that you could build. I always worry about, for example, uh, a blind person crossing the road. I, I haven't tried it in Italy, but no, in the US, every city that you go to has a different standard for what the sound is from the traffic lights to let a person cross. And often some cities will say, the walk sign is on to cross 4th Avenue. But how does the person know where 4th Avenue is? You know, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be done there with audio. And I, I believe there's whole new classes of application that can be built there. But the other one that we're working on now, we're hoping to release next year at Google I.O., is a no-code GUI, where the idea is that this will be a web-based IDE as well as an IDE that will plug into our existing IDE framework that will allow you, without writing any code, to be able to select your data. For example, I don't know, you've gathered activity detection, like I mentioned earlier on, select all that data, label it, pass it to the IDE, have the IDE spit out a model, convert that model into a version that will work on Android or iOS, and then give you the task libraries that will allow you to wrap that model so you separate yourself completely from the data science and the AI world, and you're able to build models without writing any code that you can then encapsulate into a GUI. So we're going to be showing some of this uh, sneak preview, actually, December 7th. I hope I haven't leaked a date that hasn't been announced, but December 7th uh, is uh, where, for the, for the women in the room in particular, we actually are running a Women in ML Summit. And the theme of this year's Women in ML Summit is Women Educating Everybody. And the team lead for this is a woman, and she's going to be keynoting and talking about this kind of thing. If you get a chance to tune in online, it's amazing, and check it all out. Um, some of the stuff that we've released already, how are you going to get started with that? Well, the media pipe tasks that I mentioned and the model maker stuff that I've mentioned are available online in GitHub right now. Uh, you can go and check them out. I believe I have the URL on my slides. Yeah, if you go to media pipe dev, then it's there. You know, go check that out. You can start playing with some of that code now if you want. And then some of the mo solutions that we're working on and models for those solutions are on the way. And some of this stuff will be coming in December. The rest of it will be next year at I.O. But if you look really closely at some of these models, like if you look at the lady on the upper left of this slide who's dancing, um, the idea here is that this is a face mesh model. So if you want to do anything for, I don't know, creating masks, we have an application that uses this that allows virtual trying on of makeup. But if you look really, really closely at that, you can actually see her face beneath her hair. Uh, she has long hair covering the sides of her face. And when she moves her hand across her face when she's dancing, it still is able to recognize the, uh, the anchors and the, keynote, uh, the key marks on her face there. So like, you know, little things, there's some very advanced models coming out of Google research that we're putting into this thing. And you know, we're building these APIs so that allow you to hopefully have a simple way of building apps with it. All that's coming to mediapipe.dev. Um, some pre-built solutions, just to show an example, that this one is one that we've open sourced is you know, object detection that I mentioned earlier on. Step one would be to download some pre-trained models. There's a pre-trained model for object detection called um, efficient debt. I always thought it was efficient net, but it's actually efficient debt. 
It's DET, not DEBT, but never mind. Uh, so it's a, if you go on to a TensorFlow Hub, you can download the model. And what efficient debt does in the light version is allow you to do object detection that I was talking about earlier on. So one common thing that we've seen people do is counting. Count the number of people in a room. Count the a number of cars driving past something in particular. Here is an example in this image. You can see there's a dog and a cat. So we can see there's two objects in the image, and we can actually label them. To be able to do this simply, you know, on Android, well, with your build our Gradle, you implement our task vision library, and then you have three lines of code. You know, so you uh, create the efficient debt light model by loading that. Um, we've created the model for you. And then you create an instance of a tensor image with a bitmap. So if you pull something from the camera, you've turned that into a bitmap. There's an API to turn that into a tensor image. And then you get your results back. And your results are going to be a struct containing the number of objects that it detected, the labels for those objects, and if you're interested in them, the bounding boxes for that. So again, this is all Kotlin. No Python, you know, none of that kind of uh, stuff. No new skills to learn. Download the model and just use it right away. Uh, there's a live demo app of this. Uh, let me show it very briefly. I think I'm running a little over time. You know, so I recorded this one the other day. So this is an example of using it in a mobile application where it's like just scanning over the desk. It's able to see things like a laptop, a bottle. It's not a nice green bottle like the ones we have here. By the way, when they first handed these out, I thought they were giving us absinthe. And I thought, this is going to be a really good DroidCon. Uh, and, and so th this is an example, very, very simple to build an app like this in just a few lines of code. So that's it. That's all I have time for. I think I've run a little over time. I'm sorry. So I, I can take some questions now. Um, while we're waiting for questions. Oops.